This is Lipids and Foods, and we are actually on to part three. And understanding the function with relationship to nutrition. We talked in the previous slideshow about much more of the, the, stru <laughs> the structure relating to applications in food product development. One of the key features about fat is that it has dominated a lot of our nutrition perspectives in terms of product formulation. And so it's... It, um, unlike some of the other videos where it's just sort of assumed, um, in this case, there's a lot more complexity, and so we'll get a separate slideshow just about this. So at the end of this video, we'll define the role of lipids in a variety of food product applications, and we'll talk about how fat structure impacts nutritional quality. And we'll discuss how fat structure creates different stability issues when formulating product, and we'll debate different strategies for formulating with fat nutrition in mind. And... As we mentioned before, fat has had a lot of uh, controversy in terms of its role in nutrition. Gram for gram, as, as we know, each of the different macronutrients contributes different amount of calories. So if we remember carbs, it's uh, four, four kilocalories per gram. Protein is four kilocalories per gram. Um, alcohol, seven. Water, zero. Fiber, I'm not gonna put a number there because some fibers are partially digestible in the intestine and there's a lot of, there's a lot of debate right now. How do we equate fiber? In some cases, we just equate it as zero. In other cases, we need to understand the the uh, fermentability cap uh, the fermentability within the large intestine and fat oh my gosh fat nine kilocalories per gram that's kilo calories per gram <laughs> I can't write today and honestly because of that high uh, per gram contribution there's been a lot of, um, pardon me, but demonization of fat within food product development. And as I mentioned in a previous slideshow, uh, fat has been demonized and for much of the 1980s and part of the 1990s, getting rid of fat from formulation was absolutely the most important formulation consideration. People wanted to have low calorie this and low calorie that. And the biggest net gain is by removing fat. And then we realized that people were just substituting carbohydrates and people weren't getting the satiety. Satiety, let me write that word because I like that word. It means feeling full. Satiety means that when you've eaten that food product, you have a sense of uh, physiologic satisfaction. You don't feel hungry after this. And fat is wonderful because you eat fat and you feel full. You eat carbs and you do not have that same satiety response. So this was part of the controversy. And, 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 and so you can just load up on carbs and eat carbs and eat carbs and eat carbs and you never feel full. And in, and in many respects, you end up eating more calorically than you would if you just ate fat in the first place. Another key uh, controversy, and this one is clearly documented, is the role of trans fat in cardiovascular disease. Trans fat hijacks the um, body system in terms of um, fat synthesis. Our bodies really don't understand how to, how to metabolize it properly, and as such, it tends to deposit. And uh, honestly, it increases the synthesis of, of uh, some of the negative cholesterols, low-density lipoprotein and very low-density lipoprotein in particular, such that uh, it ends up depositing within the art artery walls, and as uh, as such, it contributes to cardiovascular disease disproportionately higher than other fatty acids. And so, trans fat, as we mentioned in the previous uh, the previous slideshow, we were talking about margarine, and 
Being able to modify the melting point of fats used to be done by hydrogenation. And you would take the uh, polyunsaturated fat with all of those cis bonds, and to get rid of the cis bond, you would hydrogenate it. You would put the fat into a vessel under pressure with hydrogen and a catalyst and stir it under heat and pressure for a period of time and the, the fat would convert over first to this trans form and then eventually all those double bonds in the carbon chain would saturate with hydrogen and you'd end up with a, with a saturated fat which was much more likely to have a, um, a solid fat at room temperature. And we could then convert liquid oils, soybean oil, corn oil, etc., into margarines and into products that had spreadability that acted like butter, but um, and, and, and we would use them in baked goods, use them in uh, bakery applications and so on. And tr when trans fat was found to be absolutely conclusively linked to cardiovascular disease, most uh, industrialized countries uh, started to ban it from use in um, fabricated oils, hydrogenated oils. And so intrasterification over the past uh, 10 to 20 years has taken over as the technology of choice rather than hydrogenation. That said, to get a solid fat stock for the purpose of in, uh, intrasterification, you're going to fully hydrogenate some liquid polyunsaturated or monounsaturated fats, fully hydrogenate them, and then intrasterify them. So hydrogenation, as we just mentioned, most of the hydrogenation process, you take your oil seeds and you're going to crush them, and you're going to refine the oils out. In some cases, it's expeller pressed, where you're physically squeezing the oil out. More commonly, though, it's going to be solvent extracted. So you're applying something like uh, uh, cyclohexane or... Uh, and more or less percolating the fat out. Cyclohexane is a really great solvent and is going to pull the fat out, almost like perking coffee, where you're pulling the fat out and filtering it out. From there you can hydrogenate it and you can filter it out. And then you're going to bleach and deodorize and remove uh, any saponifiable material from that oil, blend it, and you've got, a, you've got your fat product. So again, why all the attention on trans fats? Some fats have a much more enviable reputation when it comes to their nutritional quality. So monounsaturated and polyunsaturated fatty acids have, a, uh, you could generally say, a net benefit in terms of their nutritional properties. And in particular, LDL cholesterol, I've got a slide coming up in a moment explaining these different uh, cholesterol and their roles, but... Um, in particular, these unsaturated fatty acids have not quite the same capability of increasing our LDL. Saturated is sort of a neutral fat. It used to be frowned on a bit more, but in general, uh, saturated fatty acids are seen as uh, nutritionally neutral in terms of contributing to cholesterol. Um, whereas trans increases the bad cholesterol and it decreases the good cholesterol. And it also tends to deposit within the arteries, and that can occlude your arteries and cause uh, potential cardiovascular disease. So let's just quickly summarize. I realize this is not a physiology course, but polyunsaturated fats, will, uh, when, when they're absorbed to the liver from the chylomicrons, they will be um, con converted into linoleic oil uh, CoA, and that can then synthesize cholesterol ester, but it's it, the least likely of the fatty acids to contribute to that pathway, whereas saturated fatty acids are very, very easily taken up by that pathway, and monounsaturated fatty acids also slightly contribute to that pathway. And so it's, it's really, those polyunsaturated fatty acids are the least likely to contribute to that pathway for the synthesis of the, this cholesterol ester which forms that VLDL and LDL cholesterol. So how about omega-3 fatty acids? Omega-3 fatty acids have a, have a halo around them in terms of being positives nutritionally. Omega-3 fatty acids um, contribute to the formation of 
um, anti-inflammatory prostaglandins. And when, what do I mean by anti-inflammatory prostaglandins? Well, prostaglandins are hormone-like substances within our body. Our body will take different fatty acids. It could be from omega-3 or omega-6. And these prostaglandins act as signaling factors for inflammation. It just happens that if those prostaglandins are synthesized from omega-3 fatty acids, they have a much greater likelihood to be anti-inflammatory. Whereas if they are being synthesized from omega-6, they are much more likely to be pro-inflammatory. And so by shifting our dietary pattern towards more omega-3 type fatty acids, we tend to shift our inflammation to be much lower because the prostaglandins that are mediating that uh, inflammation are synthesized with omega-3 fatty acids. And so we've got some uh, good dietary sources here, uh, many of the cold water fish, herring, salmon, um, mackerel. These are fish that have high natural amounts of omega-3, usually in uh, DHA or EPA. We also have certain fruits and vegetables. Eggs can be naturally fortified with omega-3 fatty acid by changing the diet of the chickens. If you feed the chickens more uh, soybeans and uh, flaxseed in particular, you can shift the fatty acids within the eggs so that they're, they're naturally higher in omega-3s. Um, certain oils, flax oil, um, is naturally high in omega-3s. And this is really important to note that the there's been a lot of interest to formulate food products that are naturally or, or naturally or fortified. If it's fortified, it's not exactly natural, but uh, that are containing higher amounts of omega-3 fatty acids. Now, the, the problem with this is that uh, the more unsaturation you have in your fatty acid, the more likely it is going to participate in oxidative uh, rancidity. And so what we've got is here, we've got an unsaturated lipid. And if it's exposed to... Uh, hydroxy radical, it can form a lipid radical, and with exposure to oxygen, it's going to form these lipid peroxyl radicals and lipid peroxides. And if you've ever, um, I think a good example is if you if you find a package of cookies in the back of your cupboard that got lost, and you find it a year or two later, you open that package and it smells it smells stale. It smells like wet cardboard. It, it just it, or 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 paint. That lipid peroxide has a very, very pungent, disagreeable odor, and it's it's something that food product developers need to be concerned about. And honestly, omega-3 fatty acids tend to have multiple unsaturation within it. And uh, just a quick summary here, this is... Oh, how many carbons do we have? One, two, three, four, no, oh, aren't they convenient? The blue's labeling my carbons, 19, 20, 21, 22. So docosa, docosa, it's an omega-3. So we're counting backwards, one, two, three. Counting backwards from the um, terminal carbon here. One, two, three, four, five, six. So it's hexaenoic, docosa hexaenoic acid. That would be D H A. How many double bonds? We've got six of them. And if we go back here, if we've got that unsaturated lipid interacting with oxygen, now what happens if we've got six of those unsaturated bonds within our product? It's so much more prone to oxidation. It's it's not even funny. It's it, it's so ridiculously prone to oxidation that in the case of um, the dietary supplements field, Oftentimes, if they're going about evaluating the uh, amount of DHA remaining within some of those dietary supplements, there's very little left because it is so ridiculously prone to oxidation. Now, how, how do um, product developers deal with this? If they are fortifying food products with omega-3 fatty acids. So fortification, as you re recall from nutrition class way back in the day, is where you're adding vitamins or minerals or other nutrients that are not naturally occurring within the food product to increase the nutritional value. And in Canada, some foods must be mandatory fortified, such as um, fluid milk needs to be fortified with vitamin A um, and vitamin D. In other cases, foods are voluntary fortified. And so the, for a while, there was a big push on voluntary fortification 
with omega-3 fatty acids. And you, you walk through the grocery store and everything was fortified with omega-3s, from yogurt to Wonder Bread to you name it. And, and in many cases, because of the oxidative instability of the omega-3 fatty acids, those fatty acids would be in uh, what were called micro-encapsulated forms. And so they would have all sorts of different proprietary uh, ingredient technologies where you, uh, you would have these fatty acids in, encapsulated in different formats. And in many cases, those were proprietary. So you would just call up the supplier and they'd say, oh yeah, we've got a, we've got a nice heat stable um, encapsulated omega-3 fatty acid supplement and we can't tell you what it is, but we'll, we will tell you that it's stable for pasteurization at 72 degrees Celsius or um, it's stable for UHT pasteurizing or it's stable for baking. And that's all they would tell you. And as a product developer, you would then just trust, okay, you, you send me an ingredient declaration and you send me a certificate of analysis proving that it's it's stable, and you do your own shelf stability tests to make sure that the sensory properties on that product were meeting your specification. And that's it, honestly. But uh, uh, microencapsulated omega-3 fatty acids then allow for better oxygen stability because you've got the fat encapsulated in some form of um, emulsifier or in some form of um, hydrocolloid gel. Now, the thing about omega-3 fatty acids is, is that uh, the Health Canada dietary reference intake tables don't have a discrete declaration on exactly how many grams or milligrams they want. They, they say this is how much it should be as a percent of energy. But if you consider, let's say, the typical caloric intake for someone should be, let's say, 2,000 kilocalories, if we were to... Yes, my calculator does come up in the screen share. So let's say 2,000 calories times 1.2 percent. It's 24 calories from some sort of omega-3 fatty acid. They're uh, they're recommending alpha linolenic acid, but let's just let's just use generic omega-3. So 24 divided by nine, and that will give us 2.2. 6, 6 grams of omega-3 fatty acid is what would be recommended depending on the energy expenditure of your adult. But let's use the rough number of 2,000. So 2,000 kilocalories equals 2.67 grams omega-3 fatty acid per day. And so what was what was really fascinating from a formulation perspective, those microencapsulated omega-3 fatty acids are not cheap ingredients. They are a much higher tech ingredient, and as such, the cost of these products was starting to become prohibitive. To be able to have anything remotely close to having um, a decent percent DRI, you have to fortify with quite a costly amount of omega-3 fatty acids. Oops, pardon me. And so Health Canada's um, nutrient content claims were on 300 milligrams. 300 milligrams is, n is just pushing over 1%. So, no, did I get that right? 267, oh divided by 300. No, pushing more than 10, or close to 10%. Pardon me, I got my numbers wrong. I can't think it's Sunday and it's sunny and I would like to go outside, except I need to start uploading these videos for you. So it didn't follow the same rules that you saw for nutrient content claims. It was at 300 milligrams. And the challenge is you would have, if in many cases, you would have to eat such a silly amount of the food product to be able to get even remotely close to the um, recommended daily intake for omega-3 fatty acids that a lot of different news organizations were calling out the, the farce behind the product development. And you shouldn't just go about making a uh, nutrient content claim or some other uh, health claim 
just because something's there. You want to make sure it's meaningful because right now the transparency and communications um, through social media and through mainstream media honestly will call out your farce very, very quickly. Don't just go about throwing omega-3s in there because you, you can and because you can have a label claim. Make sure it's meaningful to your consumer. So last but not least, let's leave you with some um, technologies that are commonly used in terms of maintaining the shelf stability of, of fats within different food products. Because we want to have those um, polyunsaturated and omega-3 fatty acids in particular, you often are looking at modified atmosphere. So flushing your package with nitrogen in particular prior to sealing of that package is quite common. Um, reduce light permeability. So for example, I, I put this image of uh, some Manitoba hemp oil, Manitoba harvest hemp oil. Um, this is a product that's been around for quite a bit of time. And you'll notice on the front of, on the, front of the package, it does have a, a nutrient content claim, 2,000 milligrams of omega-3 per serving, and that includes uh, 420 milligrams of gamma acid and uh, 140 milligrams of steridonic acid, which is uh, an omega-3 fatty acid. And it's in a, it's in a black package. Why? Because light, light striking that product is going to increase the oxidation rate. In some cases, you're going to use trace metal scavenging, and you may have noticed in some of the salad dressings that are out there, they're including things like citric acid and EDTA. Um, these are compounds that are capable of um, chelating out iron or zinc, other trace metals within the food products. And, and we think, well, we're not putting iron into the food product, but iron is naturally occurring. It's one of the most common um, atoms in our um, earth's crust and as we know uh, the earth makes up the soil that we are eating and a lot of that soil has iron in it and that soil becomes a contamination source in some cases foods are fortified and they're fortified with iron in other cases we're working with stainless steel which is partly iron and uh, through um, depending on the the quality of the materials that we're working on you can have oxidation that's releasing small amounts of iron into the food products and so having trace metal scavenging in certain food products is, is, really, is really critical. Another piece of the puzzle, uh, we've, I mentioned modified atmosphere, but having oxygen barrier packaging is also important. And so we think, well, plastic, it's resistant to everything. No, it's not. The oxygen barrier properties of different plastics are quite variable. And so you may have noticed, for example, potato chips are almost always packaged in a plastic mylar, a foil laminate um, plastic and the metal within that foil laminate actually has really great oxygen barrier properties whereas just plain uh, cellophane or oriented uh, polypropylene these plastic films don't necessarily have great oxygen barrier properties micro encapsulation we mentioned that before but encapsulating the fats if you have a if you have a um, bioactive fat such as um, maybe you want to fortify and it makes sense commercially to fortify with a specialty fatty acid, then you may be wanting to microencapsulate. Last but not least, we, we forget the important role of cold chain. Cold on these products helps reduce the oxidation as well. And so not exposing those products to heat, even ambient heat. And so in many cases, some of these um, highly nutritious oils um, Hemp oil, for example, you usually would buy from the refrigerator section of your health food store. Same with uh, flax oil or camelina oil. Some of these oils are maintained by cold chain to retain their nutrition properties. So I think that's it for uh, some of the nutrition considerations when it comes to function of uh, fats. And I think I have one more slideshow for you because this is a great topic and there's a lot of excitement about it. So take care and we'll talk to you again real soon because I've got... Part four coming up just next. Bye for now.